Leo, do you want to? There we go. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Friends of Latin America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube Live. Today's episode is titled, Is the Crisis in Ukraine Forcing a New U.S. Approach Towards Venezuela? My co-host today is Code Pink Latin America Policy Specialist, Leonardo Flores. Our story was inspired by news from Saturday, March 5, when a group of senior U.S. officials flew to Venezuela for a meeting with President Nicolas Maduro's government to discuss the possibility of easing sanctions on Venezuela oil exports as the Biden administration weighed a ban on imports of Russian gas and oil. The trip was the highest level U.S. visit to Venezuela in years and came as the United States was seeking to isolate Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Venezuela, Russia's most important ally in South America, was a significant supplier of crude to the United States before exports were crippled by sanctions imposed by Washington. Joining today's conversation is our friend, Carlos Ron. Carlos is Venezuelan Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America, and we're so honored to have you back with us, Carlos. Welcome. Thank you, Terry. Leo, it's a pleasure to, to be with you guys uh, uh, and to be able to, to talk a, a bit more about uh, these recent events. Uh, as always, you know that for us, our relationship with the United States and, and, and having an opportunity to speak directly to people in the United States is, of course, very important. So let's start with, I mean, I mean, you can imagine, I mean, you were in the States for many, many years in Washington. The, I mean, it was just, um, it was shocking in an exciting way in, 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 and in a very hypocritical way when the news broke of this meeting on March 5. Can you tell us how that came about and maybe some background at what led up to sure. this uh, acceptance of this meeting? Sure. So uh, so like you said, on, on March 5th, the, I mean, the, uh, this news uh, broke out of, of a meeting that took place uh, between high level uh, US uh, government officials and President Maduro uh, and also other high level officials from, from the Venezuelan government. It was the, perhaps the first meeting in a very long time of this high level uh, representation. I believe that we can say this is, it, it's, you know, there's a lot of changes going on throughout the world. I think we're, we're definitely in, in a new era of many situations that, that are going on. I think it shows, uh, it, it, uh, you know, the, the failure of that maximum pressure uh, policy that was implemented during uh, the Trump administration in the sense that it didn't amount uh, to what the U.S. Uh, had wanted uh, as an objective. And of course, it, it ended up hurting a lot of uh, Venezuelan people. Um, I think that now this new administration uh, that's been, you know, a bit over a year in, in, in government hasn't really changed or hadn't really changed, uh, you know, policies and uh, known uh, up to date, none of the uh, so-called sanctions of unilateral course of measures have been lifted or, or changed. Uh, but there was this one, uh, uh, this very important uh, first uh, meeting uh, between government officials. So I think it, it, it shows that at the end, um, you know, we've, we've always been right in saying that the best ways to, to communicate or to establish a policy uh, between Venezuela and the United States is through the channels of diplomacy, is through speaking rather than uh, through uh, aggressions. I think, we, you know, if, if there's always, uh, there's always room for, for communication or for dialogue if it comes in a respectful way. Yeah. Maduro said, uh, stated, you know, a couple of days after the meeting when he came on to live television to, to speak to the Venezuelan people about, about these issues, you know, he said it was a it was a cordial meeting, it was a diplomatic meeting, it was it was a a, a respectful meeting, and I think that's that's very important uh, for us to point out. Uh, Venezuela has never been against diplomacy. Venezuela has never been against speaking. We've been what we've been 
is reacting, of course, against uh, aggressions. I mean, you have to remember, uh, you know, in the last uh, three, four years, we've been, we have undergone attacks like, you know, a blackout that, that came out of, uh, you know, an attack uh, hacking uh, our, our electrical system, uh, an attempted uh, invasion by mercenaries, uh, uh, US trained, some of them uh, 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 coming from Colombia, coup attempt uh, led by Guaido and, and, and Leopoldo Lopez. Like all, all these things that we, all these forms of aggression, uh, and of course we're going to react and we're going to have you know a strong position against them. But what we always we've always continuously stated is that we're open to politics, we're open to diplomacy, we're open to speaking uh, on on another type of terms. So this visit I think represents a victory for diplomacy in 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 a sense. Um, that is not to say that things have uh, completely changed or that you know this is this is the beginning of conversations that we'll see if, if they continue and, and if there's the political will to continue them. But, but, but I think it is definitely an important uh, new moment where you know, diplomacy is, is at least in this moment triumphing over you know, all the other types of aggressions. To me, this meeting was really interesting because in the days just before the meeting, you had President Biden extending the U.S. national emergency with regards to Venezuela, the one that calls Venezuela an unusual and extraordinary threat to the United States, which is patently absurd. You also had uh, the United States and Colombia engaging in military exercises, maritime exercises with a nuclear submarine right off of the Venezuelan coast. So, so, so what does it say that on the one hand, Finally, after so many years, you have the United States willing to speak with Venezuela. I, I read in the media that it was the first visit by a White House official since the late 1990s, so over 20 years. And so, so at the, on the one hand, they're willing to meet, but on the other, they're still kind of keeping this pressure on Venezuela. And then right after the meeting, a few days later, you had the Colombian president, Ivan Duque, come to Washington, where you know the news was announced that Colombia was named a non-NATO major ally of the United States, which carries with it all sorts of uh, implications for the defense industry and for the uh, Colombian economy. So, so, so what do you make of, of the United States kind of talking to Venezuela, but then at the same time, almost increasing the pressure in some ways? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I, I can't speak to what's on their minds and, and, and really what, you know, what, what the, the objective or, or, or the purpose of that is. I mean, we, we can say that this is a first advance or, you know, uh, first achievement like in, in diplomatic terms. But like I said before, it, it's by no means the recomposition of relations or the, you know, uh, uh, everything is, 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 uh, is over and, and, and there's a new relationship. What I think, though, it does is definitely call for uh, or show, you know, the need to, to, to re-engage in that type of approach. In an approach for diplomacy rather than all these aggressions, but rather than you know the military threats next door, uh, you know I, I think because it, it, I feel the the, the response even uh, the way uh, President Maduro addressed nation and 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 you know and and talked favorably about this type of communication between the two countries should show people and leaders in the United States that there's a lot that we can gain from diplomacy. And, and, and much more than we lose when we resort, you know, to these other, or when they resort, let's just say, to these other types of, of, uh, uh, of aggressions and so forth. It, there's a long path, I, I believe, to, you know, uh, ahead, um, even if conversations continue, even if, you know, uh, uh, we can come to some uh, understandings. But I think, again, the diplomacy is the key where, you know, uh, uh, in, in which we should establish relationships. And I think that it was, it, it must have, it, it is very telling that the United States finally realized that they needed to come to this uh, approach. Uh, it was it was them that requested the, the visit and, and, and it was very welcomed in the sense that, you know, under these circumstances and circumstances of, communication with respect, we are willing to sit down and talk and, and listen and, and dialogue. You know, it's fascinating to me. I mean, and it's not 
been overtly discussed in the US media. Well, to some of us on the progressive and leftist news, yes. But the meeting was with the Maduro government, not the Guaido government as that has been recognized by the United States. I mean, that's basically a de facto recognition that Nicolas Maduro is the democratically elected president of Venezuela, which is huge in and of itself. It's huge in of course. Itself. And no, I, I completely agree. I think I think, I think it's, it is it was quite a it's quite important because because what we said all along all, all this time, you know, there there is there really isn't another government. There is no parallel structure that you know it, it is only a, a fiction uh, to to call Guaido interim president or, or whatever. Um, you know, it, it, and and it shows. You know, uh, as far as I'm as far as I understand. They didn't even know, uh, you know, that this was what was taking place uh, until afterwards. So it, it shows that, and you know, it's, it's telling well, a lot of these people that are willing to, uh, in a way, uh, you know, uh, do damage or call for damage on their own country, thinking that you know they will get somehow rewarded by the United States. They might as well, you know, history has shown this many times, they, they could probably end up, you know, bypassed or even ignored in, in, in moments when they're no longer uh, in, in a part of the interests of, of the U.S. So I think it, it, is, it is a positive, of course, a recognition. It's a recognition that happened not only by the U.S. government, you know, it's a recognition that even the U.S. media, mainstream media, that you know, they used to no longer call uh, President Maduro president, but you know, the regime or the the facto leader or whatever. Then all of a sudden, you start seeing all the lines again. You know, well, President Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. It's 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 funny that you have to go through this in order to come back to reality in, <laughs> in the United States. <laughs> Yeah, Historic. and going going off that, I, I mean, I think it's it's really interesting this changing media landscape that you alluded to because, you know, in the days before, weeks before this meeting, and then immediately after it, you had all these articles in mainstream uh, publications kind of changing their tone towards Venezuela. So, for example, before the meeting, the New York Times had this long piece lauding Venezuela's so-called new technocrats. Uh, you had the Washington Post in in really the most incredible opinion I've ever seen in the Washington Post, where they said it's titled behind U.S. foreign policy toward Venezuela are century old racist tropes are basically arguing that U.S. Venezuela policy has been based on white supremacy. You had an opinion in the Miami Herald of all places calling for sanctions relief. And even Bloomberg is saying, well, now Venezuela is embracing capitalism, which isn't true. But I think the, the point Bloomberg is trying to make is that it's OK to approach Venezuela. I think what's important here to recognize is that you know, uh, if you can if you can so easily change a couple of headlines and a couple of articles in, in order to show it, it's that the, it's not that reality changed in three days. Is that reality wasn't being told uh, the way it should be, and then you know uh, again, uh, like you said, you know we're in no way renouncing. Uh, you know we haven't renounced socialism. As a matter of fact. President Maduro has been since the beginning of this year uh, talking about the renewal of our socialism. We're, we're, we're talking about, we, we believe we're not at the socialism stage where we want to be. We are in a process of transition towards socialism. But this is a new moment, a new era of transition towards socialism. This is something that we, we've been discussing, but we've never renounced uh, that idea. We are that we've always said that we are we are adapting socialist policies to our own reality, to our own context, to our own time. You know, it's, it's a different moment in, in time. Um, but but you know, we, we said that, and you know, we've been claiming for so many years that this is not a war zone. This is not a place that when you come here, you you know, you guys know this because you, you've been to Venezuela in recent years. But you know that if you read the newspapers, you think that this is a war zone or. And that you can't even come here because something's going to happen to you. Like all, all of a sudden, we realized in in three or four articles that these things were, you know, uh, Venezuela some, somehow is not as bad as it seemed, or it's not as as bad as they made it seem for all these years. There's a reality here. There's a reality where uh, uh, this is a country that has been hurt 
and it is true, this, they has been hurt by this U.S. policy of sanctions. We have seen a lot of difficulties. We could have, and and you know, these sanctions were aimed at the beginning at attacking those things that we had that, that the revolution had been able to to improve and 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 to better. Uh, uh, you know, after the the years of neoliberal policies, we had strong healthcare. We had strong. Uh, uh, food uh, and, and uh, distribution, we had strong education, and all these things started being affected directly by these sanctions. Even then, though, you know, this, the people, the Venezuelan people have resisted, and, you know, we've, we've made all these strides to, you know, to make sure that we survive, and the government has tried to make, you know, make uh, use of, of the little revenues that we we're able to get, and, and not let the you know, social programs uh, die down. It's been a struggle for us. And it's been a struggle that in the last couple of months or even the last year, we've seen a lot of success uh, in, in, in you know, overcoming these difficulties. You know, for the first time in, in, in this whole year, we, we, we overcame hyperinflation. You know, this hyperinflation that we're talking about, that this, this whole year so far has, has not had those high levels of, of inflation. Uh, you know, and, and even and despite all these uh, uh, sanctions put into place, we found ways to be creative and, 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 and to move around it. So what I think is interesting is that now, now the U.S. can really uh, or should really start seeing the Venezuela that is really here, the truth about Venezuela, the Venezuela that really exists and not this, you know, mythical monster that they've built in, in the press. It's so... Um... I guess as a US citizen to say it's so astounding and hypocritical and to see the US change. I mean, we are all happy that it's happened, that it was the US that approached the Venezuelan government. Um, but to have, I mean, I would just be very coarse about it. The US has had a policy of basically starving, starving your nation, yeah. you know and denying medical access to medical supplies and technology, all of it. I mean, just on and on and on. And then just, oh, by the way, now we need your oil. It, it, it's just, um, it doesn't say much for uh, the integrity, to me as a US citizen, to me, the integrity with US diplomacy. And I think it sends a very big message to the rest of the world. That's like, well, and I, and to a certain degree, I understand this is politics and economics too. You know, everybody has certain interests at one point and then it shifts and, you know, the puzzle gets put back together in a different way. But it's very, um, it's huge that it was the US that approached the, Caracas, that it was Washington that took the, took the initiative out of need. I would say, you know, out of political need, because a lot of people are going to be very upset paying a lot of money for gas this coming summer. <laughs> well, the, I think, I think, Terry, that the, the issue here is that we have to remember it, it was never Venezuela that changed this relationship. I mean, and, and you know, even uh, since the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution, even with President Chavez uh, was here early on, Venezuela you know, develop its own uh, policies, its own independent foreign policy, develop its own social policies. You know, we, we, we went through, we started on this path for socialism and we never broke, you know, we never decided to break, you know, relations. We never decided to uh, um, uh, change uh, oil trade with uh, oil commerce with the United States. These have all been results of policies that the U.S. implemented towards Venezuela. When we finally decided to break relations in 2019, it was because of, of you know, something that, that you know, it, it was even something that we, that we were left with no choice. You have a government that in our face is basically saying, we don't recognize who would recognize this other person, who, you know, proclaims self president. It, it was really, there was no other way but to, you know, to break relations. But Venezuela had never, you know, we've never had this intention. You know, we, we, we'd always been uh, reliable trade partners. And today, you know, it's funny that, you know, they, they, if you want to really um, 
you know, trade with Venezuelan oil again and buy Venezuelan oil, it is the United States that has all, to do all the work. It's the United States that has to lift the sanctions. The United States that have to allow its companies to operate in Venezuela. It's the United States that has to allow us to access the financial system so that we can, you know, go back and and be able to to work within that system. It's never. It was never us. That's what I mean. It was never us that placed, uh, you know, these difficulties or or these, uh, you know, blocks in the relationship. So if if this ends up being uh, a construction where in 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 some you know uh, in the near future you know some of these measures are lifted and, and we start you know uh, we, we go back to something that we had before it's it's what we always you know propose it's what we always did you know it was the United States that changed that uh, the made those changes and I and I do think you know in the in the current in the current context, uh, you know the, all the issues that are going on in the world. Uh, you know we, we we're going to have a, an er energy crisis also because the planet is in, the, in, in in you know itself in a crisis mode. Uh, the, the capitalism is in a crisis mode. You know it's been there uh, many years. We 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 saw it. We've seen it more uh, in a crude way because of the pandemic. But you know uh, in order to 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 stabilize, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, it would be in the interest of, of, of the people in the United States, the movements in the United States, you know, everybody should sort of think, you know, it, it would be better to go back to diplomacy, it would be better to go back to the other type of relations that we used to have in Venezuela, so that things can, you know, kind of uh, stabilize. Uh, you know, I think, I think you should, it, it could be uh, even a, something that, that worth uh, rallying around, you know. So right now in the United States and in Europe, we're seeing kind of corporate media really demonize not just Russia, not just Vladimir Putin, but also the Russian people. What's the perspective on, on this conflict from Venezuela and from kind of the global south? How, are, how is Venezuela seeing what's going on in the Ukraine? What does Venezuela think about, about Russia and the Russian people? Look, I, I, I need, I, I, I believe that we have to start by saying something uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's very important. We've always believed, uh, you know, we're talking about diplomacy, we've always believed in the diplomacy of peace. Uh, you know, and, and we are, of course, against uh, conflicts. We're, we're very, President Maduro has said it, has said it uh, as well. You know, we are con very concerned about, you know, things escalating and, and, and going into another, uh, direction uh, that, that could engage possibly the world into a, a major confrontation, and and you know, uh, we definitely believe that that we need as a as an international community, as a global community, we need to do things so that you know uh, conflicts uh, scale down, so that you know we can return to diplomacy. Now, we can't have this conversation without. Uh, noticing or without realizing that these are issues that have been going on not since February, but that have been going on for many years. Uh, you know, there are issues uh, that threaten that that you know that, that that put in jeopardy Russia's security. Uh, you know, since many years ago, that put in jeopardy the lives of, of ethnic Russians within Ukraine, you know, since many years ago. Uh, you know, how many people have died in, in, in the conflicts uh, prior to, uh, to this recent uh, operation in February? Uh, and, and those things are not in the news or, you know, they, they don't make the, the news cycle. Uh, and, any, and in any case, you know, if, if you have a NATO that is uh, providing uh, more weapons uh, that is calling for, you know, uh, building up, uh, you know, uh, a larger conflict, then of course, you know, we, we're all going to feel threatened. And, and this is something, this is completely the wrong direction. Well, you should have, we believe countries in NATO and elsewhere should, pro, should you know, be uh, promoting peace, understanding, meetings, you know, sit down, let's, let's sit down, let's talk, you know, that's, that's the way you de-escalate, not by sending more uh, 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 weapons and planes or whatever, you know, offering things that, that would continue or, or exacerbate 
uh, a military conflict. Um, and, and there's another thing, uh, you know, we don't think the solutions, I mean, we've experienced throughout all these years, uh, these unilateral coercive measures. Now, when you say, you see the everyday new sanctions against Russia are announced and new things, well, where is that going to lead? Because we haven't, we know the sanctions definitely do not lead to prosperity, to, uh, you know, uh, to any of the goals that are, that are set, except for uh, the, the, that, that goal that, that you cannot admit in public, which is that you want to hurt the people of that country you sanction. So at the end of the day, what, you know, if that's going to be the solution offered by the US, are we gonna put sanctions and a stronger sanctions than ever on Russia? Is that going, who's that going to hurt? No, nowhere in the world has have sanctions hurt anybody but the common people of any of those countries in question. So having lived through that, having lived through, um, you know, all these uh, attacks, uh, the xenophobia that, that has uh, spread in, even in this region against Venezuelans, when, when some Venezuelans have been forced because of the sanctions to migrate to other countries. So we know, you know, that when that discrimination, that, that, that attack, having lived through censorship as, you know, as Venezuelans, uh, uh, you know, we, there's, there's no media information that comes from Venezuela that you can listen to. Uh, Telesur is not something that you could easily uh, access uh, in, in, you know, in the north and so forth. Well, having lived through this, we, we see what's going on in Russia, uh, you know, towards Russia. And we're, you know, we understand uh, that this is, you know, this is something uh, negative uh, uh, and, and that, you know, we definitely don't agree with, and we definitely don't, don't support. We have expressed our support uh, to the Russian people, to the Russian government in, 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 in a sense that we know these actions that are being taken place against them are, are very dangerous. I mean, just the fact that this is, as ridiculous as things are getting, uh, that you know you want to you want to erase uh, Yuri Gagarin from you know uh, space uh, history. So as if this man never reached space. I mean, how 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 ludicrous is this? I mean, how far are we willing to go to accept uh, and, and to normalize this? You know, it, it, we've lived it. I mean, we've seen things against Venezuela. How our own our own history has been turned upside down by this narrative. Now we see it going on in Russia. Well, when is this going to stop? You know, uh, so I think uh, we sympathize with that, uh, with what we understand what's going on in Russia because we live something similar. You are in a really unique position sitting in Caracas and particularly working for the Venezuelan foreign ministry, but being Venezuelan where you and Leonardo Post, you have a relationship, a long history with the United States, which has, you know, and has had a real positive turn in events this month, but you have a very strong uh, relationship with, with Russia as well. I mean, I have seen the, you know, the humanitarian aid that's come into the country and specifically sacks of wheat when, you know, wasn't possible for Venezuela to produce its own food. Fertilizing companies were sanctioned. I mean, on and on, anything you tried to do was sanctioned so that you couldn't do anything to help yourselves. So how, I mean, that's a really, you sit in a very, very unique place at this moment in history that you are so close to the states with a perhaps a, you know, a restoration on the horizon of diplomatic uh, ties their relationship there, but this really, really important um, relationship with Russia too. So, you know, I think we have to, uh, you know, I think this was important and, and, and I, uh, you know, the important reflection that I've heard during the past couple of days is that we, we should also, in this current context, um, try to not be pushed into the lens of the Cold War or the Cold War mentality. You know, the fact that Venezuela, Venezuela, like you said, has a wonderful relationship with Russia. Russia has been a, a country that has shown solidarity to Venezuela at the worst moments. When the United States blocked our 
capability of purchasing vaccines uh, through the COVAX method in the United Nations, we were able to obtain vaccines from Russia and, 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 you know, and confront this pandemic. Uh, the same way we've been able to obtain help from Cuba, from China, et cetera. Um, so the world has changed. This is no longer, first of all, it's no longer a unipolar world. It's no longer a world where you know the U.S. is the complete uh, dominant, as, as it was perhaps for 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 some time after the fall of Berlin Wall. But it's also not the bipolar world world of the Cold War, and we shouldn't let ourselves be dragged into that position of you know saying you know one or the other, and you know this because I I think that's that's really hurtful for the rest of the world. You know I think that we can look forward to having a respectful relations with the United States where we can you know, trade and, and, and have exchanges you know, in the way countries that respect each other should and maintain a relationship of friendship and solidarity and alliance with Russia and with China, with Iran, with you know, all these other countries that we've already established relationship with. The world is, the, you know, we're, we shouldn't fall into this uh, as a country, I mean, we shouldn't fall into the trap of having to choose one or the other. Or a, the world is no longer divided in those terms. The world is divided, and you know, if we as a, as a sovereign nation should really be looking towards where, who can we cooperate with to, you know, obtain true benefits for our, our people, to obtain through, in you know, exchanges that are profitable for you know, both countries, rather than seeing, you know, this line we can't cross, you know, because if you do, you're, you're with us or we're, you're with the enemy and so forth. We have to overcome that, that you know, uh, mentality, splitting the world into, into halves. Mm -hmm. This is another type of world now. I'm like really pleased to hear that. And I think, as I've thought, boy, since this meeting of March 5, it's like the Venezuelans could really teach the U.S. something here. It is a multilateral world. The U.S. hasn't recognized it. And if it has, it's, it's going to take a while to accept it, if ever, in my in my opinion. But your country is such a great example of what's possible. I mean, you have you have allies, trade relationships, diplomatic relationships all over the world, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, east, west, and it, it's such a beautiful example of what's of what's possible and what's what's emerging and, and in a big part of the world, what has emerged, I would say. It's, and that's part of what the U.S. is trying to stop or control, perhaps. You know, I think we, we learned this uh, from President Chavez's foreign policy. Um, if you remember when CELAC was constituted, uh, which is that, that space where all of Latin America meets, uh, you know, it was, uh, we had a, uh, the government of Colombia was a very, uh, you know, uh, aggressive and, and, and there's a lot of distance uh, ideologically, completely another world uh, between Venezuela and, and that government and many of the other governments in the region. Well, we came together because, of, you know, common issues that, that, that and common challenges that we had, uh, uh, that we all faced uh, in the same way. I think that that's, you know, we've learned that you don't necessarily have to uh, agree on everything or have the same ideological perspective in order to have relations with, with another country. I mean, it would, be, it would be fantastic, and I honestly say this, and I honestly believe this, it would, it would be fantastic if we, through the process of more communications, more exchanges, we can, you know, again, have our embassy back and, and, you know, again, open, uh, uh, you know, relationship that, you know, Alex Saab was a diplomat who was unjustly uh, detained in, in, in the United States, can come back uh, to Venezuela. You know, we, it would be great if we could have a, a, a normal type of relationship where, you know, we don't have to see things eye to eye. I know, and you all know this, that the United States doesn't necessarily see eye to eye with all its, uh, all the other countries has a relationship with, but uh, but you know, but there's a thing about diplomacy and 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 that you know that allows them to have relations, 
this is this has always been the aspiration of Venezuela. You know, we don't, we don't, we and we've never said to anyone, we want to impose our worldview on you. We want to impose our model, our political model on you, our social model on you. We have an experience. You know, you're welcome to to learn from it and and and, and to do what you want that that will help you. But we've never tried to impose anything on anyone. And I think that's the world we should strive towards, you know, a world where, you know, we can always talk and recognize each other's differences. I'm glad you mentioned Alex, uh, because as we know, last fall, you know, between August and October, the Venezuelan government was engaged in dialogue with the Guaido faction of the opposition. And this dialogue ended when the United States illegally extradited Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab. Uh, but just after the this meeting on, on March 5th between the White House and President Maduro, the president announced that you know, the dialogue with the opposition would restart. But not only that, he said he was going to expand it to not just include the Guaido faction, but also the, the what we can call the more moderate factions of the opposition. Can you talk a little bit about, about this new dialogue that's going to happen and, and what that means that might mean for, for Alex Saab? Sure. I think, well, first of all, you know, we, we maintain, we firmly maintain our position in, in the sense that uh, we believe Alex Saab is has been unjustly detained. That, that you know he must be uh, freed. He must be uh, liberated. He must be able to come back to his family. Now, uh, President Maduro said, you know, if if we talk about dialogue, he said on, on, on a, a live television after the the events of, of March fifth, if if we talk about dialogue, uh, we must also be the ones to give the example. So, and that's when he said, you know, he announced that we would come back to dialogue with all sides, all those that are interested in, in, in dialogue for, for a better political uh, moment for Venezuela, for, you know, to, to, to improve these, these communications. So I think uh, what, what we see is, uh, you know, there's a necessity to not only uh, discuss things with uh, that group that's represented by uh, the, the Guaido unitary platform. But there's a lot of other actors here in Venezuela that are important to take into consideration. As a matter of fact, if you look at the, at the results of the November elections, you, you'll find some uh, quite interesting numbers where you see that the amount of votes uh, of the opposition that is sort of aligned with the Guaido uh, factions and the amount of votes of another opposition that that has not called for sanctions that but that has continued to participate in politics in Venezuela, they kind of they're almost equal in in numbers. So this myth that Guaido represents the opposition or is the main opposition well, that that kind of that kind of withered down during those elections. And that is part of, as a result of, of people not identifying with a sector that's calling for more sanctions and for blockades and for all these unconstitutional uh, uh, ways out of uh, you know uh, government. I think that if anything that has been shown throughout all this all these years is the commitment of the Venezuelan people to a democratic process and to democratic processes. Uh, so so it, it is only fair and and and. I think uh, legitimate that if if we're going to have a national dialogue, then the nation must be better represented, both you know uh, uh, government and the different uh, factions uh, of the opposition. Wow, it, it, it's a great project, and and I just have to say that it's really um, for our audience that that hasn't been to Venezuela. It's really a testament, Carlos, to you and your people, what, what has happened in Venezuela since 1998 and what you have lived through um, with this economic warfare placed on you by the United States. It's, you know, Venezuela is a nation of people still to this day, despite everything, and it's very palpable when you walk the streets of Caracas, but not just Caracas, any, any city throughout Venezuela, you can really feel that people are Venezuelans first. They love each other and their country. And I remember maybe 10 years ago, maybe less than that, 
talking. I had come back from a delegation from Venezuela and I had a chance to meet with my, my congressman, Jared Huffman uh, in California. And I said, you know, we're just kind of sharing the experiences I had in Venezuela with them. I said, you have to understand there's never gonna be a civil war in Venezuela. It's not gonna happen. These people are not gonna fight each other. They see their country first. And, and I would say a lot of this US foreign and economic policy directed towards you and your, and your country has, has made it stronger. It's a stronger sense of nationality. And, that, and I don't think, I think that's true for other countries that are suffering um, enormous uh, economic warfare imposed by the United States as well. It, it, it has the inverse effect that it's intended to have. That doesn't excuse or, you know, the, the daily hardships, extraordinary daily hardships in a few years that I witnessed. Um, but it's really, I mean, it's a real testament what all of you have lived through and that and you're, and you're still standing and standing strong and standing so proud. And it's a really beautiful thing. I think, I think these, uh, you know, the, 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 the people of Venezuela are, are great people. Uh, you know, I think we, we've shown resilience uh, throughout these years. It hasn't been easy. It has, it has uh, you know, a lot of consciousness, uh, you know, that, that, that has come to be the, the essence of, you know, motivating people to, to continue uh, struggle. But, but it's also, um, it's a conviction that you're doing the right thing and that you have, and that you, you have a right to, to choose your path, yeah. you know, and, and, and I think that's, that's primarily, you know, what, what guides, uh, what guides us. In the end, like I said, you know, what, what we, we want this prosperity for, for Venezuelans. We want people to have a dignified life. Um, and, and we want, and we don't want to be in conflict with anybody around the world. We, you know, we are a peace loving nation. We haven't been in conflict since our independence movement, uh, you know, with, with any other nation. I think what we're trying to do is really build a different society and a different society that, that is built on solidarity and other principles, cooperation, solidarity, uh, these, these type of, of values. We live in a world right now that is that, that I think is deeply uh, struggling to, to find its values. Uh, I mean, and, and you know, when you see the rise of these, uh, of hate, you know, of this uh, uh, xenophobia, of, the, of these fascist practices, um, throughout the world, then, you know, you, you realize that our crisis is not only a crisis of the environment, it's not only a crisis of, of the economic system, it's a crisis of values. And, you know, in, in, in trying to construct a socialist uh, society, we, we've learned that to survive, we've had to rely on on the values of solidarity, on the values of cooperation, on the values of, you know, people helping each other out and, and, and trying to uh, to really stick it, you know, stick through it together and not just, you know, each on his own. So I, I, I think that what what has allowed us really to resist, and, and it, it may sound a bit romantic, but uh, it's really it's really not, you know, I, I say it no from, not from a, Figure a speech. I say from what I've seen and what I what we lived through. What has allowed us to survive this has been sticking together. Has been you know a, a, a real unity and cohesion of the people, and that's that's and those are the values that I think are needed for the, the challenges that we have ahead in the world. On that note, Carlos, we really want to thank you for appearing on WTF with us. This was a really great conversation. Lots of insights into what's going on in Venezuela, and just uh, you know that spirit that you mentioned of the Venezuelan people of their mm -hmm. ability to resist and come together in the face of such great adversity. Well, thank you very much. Always a, a pleasure uh, to be able to talk to you, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, we'll move. Hopefully, we can find ways to to increase uh, these. Uh, this efforts on diplomacy and, and, you know, we can, so that we can once again have a, a, a stronger and more fruitful relationship and, and, and bridges with the people of the United States.
Thank you so much. It looks hopeful in this particular moment. We're all kind of. <laughs> well, I think I think that uh, you know things are. We have to take things always one step at a time uh, to be realistic and to. Uh, uh, but but we we always act with hope as our guide, and you know because we we need to believe that things are, are, are going to develop into more positive ways. Uh, so. You know, we always march towards a uh, positive horizon. Oh, thank you again. I'm so happy you had time for us today. Always a pleasure to oh, see you and talk pleasure. with you. So I want my to remind pleasure. our audience that you've been watching What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. We broadcast every Wednesday evening on Code Pink YouTube Live at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And also don't forget to catch Code Pink Radio broadcasting every Thursday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern on WBAI out of New York City and WPFW out of Washington, D.C. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll talk with you next week.